Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Today I'm speaking with Erica Sanzi. Erica writes on Substack. You can find her at Sanzi Says. She's also the editor at Project Forever Free, and she's a visiting fellow at Fordham Institute. I've been following her recently, and I've been reading some of her stuff on Substack. It's about um, a lot of the stuff she writes about is K through 12 education, uh, which is something that I've been kind of worried about for a while. And I mean, she'll also touch on the culture stuff and some of the politics stuff. So, hey, Erica, thank you for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So, like, like I said, I started following you, I think, recently, probably within the last year or so. And some of your stuff um, that you're putting out, like a lot of the stuff with the schools, um, like, how did you get into that? And what made you start looking at the schools? And why did you want to start writing about that? Uh, I came to it sort of through a variety of avenues. Um, I had been an educator for about a decade before I started writing about education. Mm -hmm. And I had taught in a variety of different kinds of schools. So I am a, I've been a district school teacher. I've been a charter school teacher and I've um, also taught in parochial schools. So Catholic schools. Um, And then I also I came out of a school system as a student, graduated from high school in 1991 from a school system that was really, really strong, incredibly well resourced. And so for me, my normal, because when you're a kid, you often haven't had exposure to places that are that different. So to me, that was what school was. You had the books you needed, you had teachers who knew what they were talking about. You had high expectations. The facilities were excellent, which I didn't realize was excellent at the time. But then as I, uh, as I went back and taught at my, my high school, so I was an alumni teacher there for four years, and then began to see other places. So my husband, he wasn't my husband yet, but he got Navy orders to San Diego. So we relocated from Massachusetts to San Diego And I began working at a school that had about the exact same number of students as the one I had left behind, but half the staff. And that was sort of my first, whoa, wait a second here. You mean everybody doesn't have seven guidance counselors to, you know, guide their 95% of students that are going to go on to four-year colleges? And, you know, not everybody can bring their books home at night to do their work because they don't have enough books to go around. So that that was my first... Oprah used to call them like your aha moments, right? So that that was one big moment for me, which was seeing the difference in what's available to students when they are assigned to their schools based on where they live. And that experience in Southern California was also very important because where I had been originally, barely any active duty military, right? So that wasn't even like a part of my experience and exposure did not really include military families. And suddenly here I was working in a school in a district that was home to a massive Navy base and where, you know, aircraft carriers were docked. And I had tons of students whose parents were active duty military, children of officers and children of enlisted personnel where, you know, my student's mom was the hygienist on an aircraft carrier or my student's father was a chef on an aircraft carrier. And so again, new exposure to people coming from all different places, all different backgrounds, all different levels of expectations for their own children's education, um, students who move all the time, et cetera. So I had, you know, that was another glimpse. And then when my husband's orders were over and six weeks after my first child was born, we drove back to the East coast and which is where we were from and settled in Rhode Island because it had much for much more affordable housing than our home state of Massachusetts did and still kept us within an hour of our parents. And I stayed home for seven years with my children. And towards the tail end of that, I started looking at educational data around uh, where I live and suddenly said, what in the world? Because again, I was not used to I hadn't really looked at data that much when I wasn't a parent. And here I was now looking and seeing, oh, great, only 30% of the students in my town where I just bought a house are proficient in math. Or, you know, I started looking at uh, student outcomes and 
became an education advocate at that time and threw my hat in the ring to run for an elected school committee seat. Okay. Well, I mean, like um, when you're, when you started looking at these stats, like what, around what year are we talking about? 2010 or 2000, okay. either around 2009 and 2010. Okay. So the, so I think what you said, 30% proficiency in math. At the time, the, the figure that stands out to me at the time was that in the, that the math proficiency rate overall in my district was in the very low 30s. Okay, so now, like, was there a decline going up to it? Or, like, do you remember that? Like, it was, or was it just, um, do you just remember that number? It's just because I'm trying to think, like, the way I've looked at this, and I see the change happening around the late 90s, the way they were focusing on stuff. And so, um, like the focus went, I think that was the, one of the big shifts when it went from like objectivity to narrative and even hmm. that kind of get it started getting into the education. And I'm not saying that they were pushed, like, I'm not saying this was a organized plan thing. I think if you go back, that's the way the education, like the, the colleges of education were working. So their teachers are coming out thinking like that. And then especially after nine 11, I think like, you know, you know, you can talk about the media spin or whatever, but there was narrative became much more important than objectivity. So if you're starting to teach, like if you're starting to teach um, based on a narrative and you're not teaching some sort of objectivity and that's seeping into the curriculum, like obviously you're going to see a drop in like math. I mean, it might help in English. I don't know because you're talking about narratives. Like I said, like you're talking about narratives and stories in English, but something like maths, you need, you need that objectivity. You can't just be all about stories. Like, I don't know. I mean, I know people, some people complain about common core. Some people say like, you know, no child left behind. It drops off after you're about the third grade and stuff like that. Like, I don't know if that's part of the issue. And I, I don't know if the other part of the issue is the exact, like the, the standardized testing. Like when you're teaching, like you're having that many standardized tests in a year, and you're teaching to the test, not to the subject. I mean, that's got to ha have an effect on the students. Or, I mean, one of the things that I think is mi is missed in this conversation and basically all conversations is that it's very complex and messy, right? And there's no one answer as to why as to why we're having the issues that we're having. Um, so, for example, I haven't found felt that my children were over-tested, but I have certainly heard this said a lot that, you know, people try to imply that there's so much testing or that the schools are teaching to the test. One thing I have learned is that high quality instruction is by definition, like when people talk about test prep, test prep really should be high quality instruction that hits the standards that students are going to be assessed on. But what happens when there's pressure to do better on tests is there are places where they go into they where they actually go into test prep mode as if, you know, it's one thing when a parent signs their child up for an SAT prep class, then you're expecting that, right? You're expecting to practice for a test. But in K-12 education, you know, if I had a magic wand, you would just have instruction that was strong enough that it it organically prepared students to perform well on these tests that are really designed to test proficiency. And they're really designed to give us an indicator is do you exceed the grade level benchmark? Are you at it? You know, are you approaching it or are you just so far below it that you're in like emergency territory? Um, so, I've always been like a pro testing advocate, but, but that's largely because I feel that when we put as much money and investment into something as important as educating children, we need some sort of indicator each year as to sort of how we're doing. And I, as a parent, very much want to see how are you doing and how are you doing compared to other students in the state, other students in other places that take the same test. So um, 
and I would also just add, I guess, that a, another big piece of why we're struggling, though this doesn't explain the math scores, but is that when it became about only math and English, right? Those were the, those were the subjects that were going to be tested. What happened was that some schools went into hyper, hyper focus on math and English and other subjects fell by the wayside. And when other subjects fall by the wayside, you're now reducing the knowledge, the actual content knowledge that children are being exposed to. So if you're having far, if you have far less knowledge, then, then, you know, taking an English test is a lot harder because there's much more likelihood there's going to be references that you don't know, words that you don't know, things that are unfamiliar to you. Um, so I think we've made a lot of mistakes for sure. On the other hand, I can't, you know, I can't look at scores and see that in the city of Providence, Rhode Island, for example, the state I live in, our capital city, that if I were to line up 10 black boys, not even one of them reads on grade level. Yeah, that's depressing. And and like what you said about like a lot of things going on, there is, um, like I've, again, I've just I sh I started looking at this when I came back from overseas, and I'm I'm looking at some of the things. Okay, so some of the things Jonathan Haidt talks about, and then um, also what he and Greg Lukianoff talk about in the Coddling mm -hmm. American Mind. Um, it was starting around eighty five when you started getting more vigilant parents, right? So you had the 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 like the the scare of stranger danger and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And so you add that in um, around the same time was when you had some of the, like some of the stuff in uh, the colleges of education change. So one of the things, like, I think one of the big things that came in was repressive tolerance. So you have to repress things that are uh, oppressing marginalized people and like the idea of harm uh, that came into like teaching teachers. But, so I think like each of these things compounded each other. So when the parents are spending so much time, like, you know, you got to take your kids to like hockey practice. You can't leave them alone. If you let your kids walk. I mean, I know with it slowly progressed worse, but, you know, you let your kid walk to the park down the block, child protective services is going to be called on you. So parents are over parenting and under parenting. So, and also if you have like, you know, single family homes rose, you're a single parent. You, you can't always go through the curriculum. You're looking at stuff. It's like, okay, well, they're teaching about this or, you know, the, they're, they've got all this math homework, so they must be doing math, but you're not really looking at what the homework is. You're just saying, okay, you're sitting there doing your math homework. You're sitting there doing your English homework. Like, I don't know what one single solution is. I mean, I, I, I think you're going to have to do a lot of things at once. Like I know in Idaho, they just passed something. I, th I think it was Idaho. It might've been Iowa, um, uh, a free range kids law. Oh yes, where, I did see that, and I, I think it is Idaho actually. Yeah, and I mean there that lets some pressure off parents, and then I mean, the education side of things. Like I, you know, I keep reading like I'm like reading in New York City and uh, Cal, and then also in California a lot of, you know, they want to get rid of grading because grading is racist. They want to. I mean they like basically being giving everyone, like just passing everyone. Like, I don't know how long that's been going on for, but you can't really fail kids anymore. Um, like when did that kind of stuff start? Oh, like it is. Um, well, as soon as graduation rates became an important data point, right. Um, that schools or districts knew they were going to be judged on because as with anything, as soon as you know, you're going to be judged on something, you, you, you do it. You, you end up, finding ways to juke the stats and graduation rates. I mean, they've long been inflated. Um, we've long been giving diplomas to students that are just not profi proficient in basic skills. Um, and so, and we know that, right? Because you wouldn't see, I don't know, you wouldn't see an 88% graduation rate and then um a consistent finding that, on, that on, only a third of students read on grade level, right? I mean, so if, if you look at the, at the, there's just, there's it's such a big disconnect between our graduation rates and, and how our students are doing and our graduation rates don't sync up at all with how students do in, when they go on to higher education. 
So for example, I think nationwide, more than half of students that go on to community college um, have to take remedial courses when they get there before they can enroll in any actual college courses for credit. I'm trying to get the logic around this. So, you know, people are graduating, but they're not reading. So instead of trying to fix the problem behind the reading, we'll just get rid of the marking system because the marking system is racist or whatever. It's unfair. Like it's Well, this has definitely shifted a little uh -huh. bit during COVID, right? So, so the whole meaningless diploma conversation is about kids from all backgrounds and all races. Mm -hmm. um, certainly yeah. there's probably some disproportionate representation among um, black children and Hispanic children and, you know, students for whom English isn't their first language, but it, the problem isn't unique to them. Um, then during COVID came and some places like where I live said, we're going to keep on grading work like we always have. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to pretend that any of this is normal, but we're going to do the best we can. And you're going to be held accountable and graded for your work. And I, as a mother, am very grateful that I live in a place where that's what they decided to do. But as we saw in a lot of places, California especially popped up a lot with this, San Francisco, San Diego, New York City. Um, and actually, it may be Providence, too, now that I think about it. Teachers have reached out to me about this. They started to set these rules for teachers. You know, you can't fail anybody. You can't give anything below a C. You have to give an incomplete, even if a student hasn't turned in a single thing all semester. You know, that's not what an incomplete is. An incomplete has always been... For some reason, you didn't, you know, maybe you still have a test to make up. Maybe you were out and you need a little bit of time to make stuff up. But it was never, you didn't do a single thing the whole semester. And now suddenly, you know, we're going to pretend that you, that as long as you make up this little bit of work, you're going to be able to do it. So teachers have lost the ability to, I don't know what the, even the word is, the accountability system has completely collapsed. And, but, we still continue to promote students through the grades. Now, part of the reason that we promote students is that they call it, so they don't call it, they used to call it staying back and now they call it retaining, right? So retaining a student. So a kid gets held back to repeat um, eighth grade. Okay, fine. The problem is that there's evidence that if you retain a student more than once, you significantly increase their chances of dropping out. So you rarely will ever see people advocating for retaining a student more than once. But that presents a major problem to high schools who have students sitting in their seats who read at first grade and second grade levels, right? Because, and, and, I, and people may say she's gotta be exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, I have a good friend who runs a school and she runs a school that serves mostly um, pregnant and parenting teens who are often over age, undercredited, and who, for whom her school is like their last shot at getting their high school diploma. They've either been pushed out or expelled or dropped out from whatever district school they attended. Their transcripts come in and they have them having passed all of these classes, American Lit, British Literature, you know, B plus, C plus. And so they come in with all these credits and all of these transcripts that imply this person is literate, right? And sometimes what will happen is she or someone at her school will discover there is something really major going on here. So they'll do the reading tests that they give to the younger children. And she has students, she's had students before high school aged who don't even they come in as a BR, which is before reading, which means that they're not even at the kindergarten, first grade level. So, so here's the question, right? You've got to, if you have a 17 year old sitting in front of you with a transcript that has them says that they've passed 10 grades, right? They've passed through 10 years of school and they are in front of you and they are 100% illiterate in the sense that they can barely read at a child's level. They certainly can't read science textbooks, you know, for information. None of the <laughs> solutions you were, like you and I can talk right now. Right. And in that moment, it's like, what do you do? Yeah. But okay. That's what, okay. So 
because they're still because the problems go back are so entrenched and and are so baked into a system that is fundamentally broken and yet if we hand the diploma to that person right and indicate to the world that they are coming out with high school skills that diploma is I, I, I just don't know what to say like what about all the teachers who are letting all these kids go through like aren't any of them raising like if if one of them raises an alarm are they silenced or is it why is no one saying anything? I, why, I, mean, I think it's a mix. So for example, there are teachers who are saying things. There was a massive scandal in DC a few years ago where kids were not showing up to school. They had, you know, 80 absences. They were getting to graduate. Teachers were furious about it. They had like no control. Some I think resigned over it. So I do think that teachers do speak out again, not all, because again, Teachers are just human beings, mm. right? And so some of them care so deeply about this, it keeps them awake at night and they are trying to fight it. You know, others of them, they'll say, it's not my problem, right? And then everything in between. So it's very difficult to generalize about teachers. But there's, again, because this is so messy, it's going to be an exercise in frustration, I think, for listeners and probably for you. So let me just add a little bit more information too, right? The vast majority of teachers in the U.S., when they go to a teacher prep program, because they have to get this, you know, we have to, you have to get this teaching credential. Credential, by the way, I'm putting in air quotes. Um, many of them, like the elementary teachers come out, most of them are not trained in how to actually teach reading. They're not, in the they're not trained in the fundamentals of the science of reading. How, how, does, how do we know if scientifically in an evidence-based way that children best learn to read? So that's a problem, right? My own state commissioner said on a television show a few years ago that one of the reasons we were having so much trouble with math was that a large proportion of our teachers did not understand fractions. That's that right. So, so you're like, my, right? I mean, it's it is. Uh, the now imagine the commissioner of education in my state on a television program said that they had identified that a big problem was that the teachers in the classes didn't understand proportionality. You need an entire rework of the system. I mean, yep. Okay, now with all this that's going on. Um, charter schools now i know that not every charter school is a success and not you know correct and there are public schools that are you know like district public schools that are successes and you know, others that aren't and so but why are people looking at the schools that work and say why can't we do that here or you know like i understand from the union side of things like they're protecting themselves and their jobs they're making themselves be relevant mm -hmm. i guess but the parents should have the choice of what kind of school to go to and to be forced into like, if you know, the school in your district is awful and you know, all the statistics, but there's a, you know, like um, it was in uh, Thomas Sowell's latest book uh, about charter schools, you know, and yes. then I just spoke with uh, Ian Rowe recently and he said the same thing, mm. you know, in the same building, a district school and a charter school and the charter schools, kids are doing, you know, like the best in the district or, you know, city or whatever and the district school they're just at the bottom i mean it's the same population you know same everything for these kids except some are going to a charter school and some aren't in it like when you look at stuff like that like how can people just bury their heads in the sands like i heard okay i'm gonna ramble a little bit more like i heard in uh new york city this was in 2019 they were having uh, like PTA meetings and that kind of stuff. And then they were having a, a board meeting and they, at one point they stopped the parents from coming in. And this is when they were kind of deciding that they're going to have to be culturally sensitive when it comes to handing working on time and showing up on time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, for the nine, nine white kids, if you, if you treat them like that, you're not being culturally sensitive. So you have to be, take their culture into account. You know, you know, I'm Brown. If I had parents, and my kid was coming in late. My kid wasn't handing his homework on time. You know, yeah, I want to know, and I want him punished for that. Or when I say punished, like, okay, you know what? You fail that assignment. 
he has to have yep. some sort of consequence. Um, but like, like how, I don't understand how people can look at, you know, like it's, it's right there in front of you. How could you look at that and just bury your head in the sand? Like, don't you want what's well, best for the kids? It, keep in mind, right? Like, so the average person out there isn't reading Thomas soul. Yeah. Doesn't really know what a charter school is. Um, doesn't know the, their, you know, I mean, if doesn't even know much at all about their, the data of their school district or how they're, or how kids are doing. I mean, they don't, so it's like, it's very much like the, there's just like a, I'm not using robotic in a disparaging way, but it's like your kid goes to, you know, you get up in the morning, they go to school, you go to work, report card looks okay. Conference with the teacher goes fine. You know, nobody's throwing up any red flags. You, you know, maybe don't know enough to notice on your own that there's a problem. Who knows? So, so the, it, it there is a lot of um, indifference. There's a lot of lack of information. Um, and so, well, it is sort of true. Like we could make the argument that parents are kind of heads in the sand on this. It's, you also cannot, um, you, it's impossible to overstate the power of the teachers unions in the United States. It is like, um, like when, you know how people talk about a David and Goliath scenario, that is what the idea, you know, that is like parents wanting something different versus teachers unions. I mean, just not because it's not just the money. They are the biggest donors. I mean, I, I can't remember if they're top one, two or if they're maybe, but they're in the tip top of donors to the Democratic Party mm -hmm. and to Democratic candidates. But they also provide an army of soldiers because, you know, they're in some places there's pressure that, you know, you teachers will have a sign for this person in your yard, or you will stand outside on election day and support that, you know, there's a lot of, of manpower. You have people that are, that'll go door to door for you. So if there's a push for more charter schools and you're against them, you have an army of people that will go out and spread lies about charter schools to get people, the public to not only dislike them, but, believes the smears that they're told about them right so that's one thing um and it is to, and, and by the way i am an agnostic about school governance models i am quite positive based on the 10 years i've spent you know writing about this reading about this talking to families there are schools that are a good fit for every single you know for children out there and they often look very different Within families, even, we see that the district school, that their zip code school might work great for one of their kids, and it's an absolute disaster for another child of theirs. And maybe that child does better in a smaller private school. Maybe that child does better in a charter school. Maybe that child does better in an online schooling environment. So I'm agnostic, but, but a lot of people are not, right? So it's like you're either for the residentially assigned district schools that the unions rule or you're the enemy. Okay. I mean, yes, I agree with you. There's not, you know, there's no one cookie cutter approach here, but if you're a parent and you've got a couple of kids or three kids or whatever, and you know, one of your kids is doing really well in one school, the other two aren't, but then you hear about another school somewhere else and you can put, you know, if you have the choice to move your kids, I'm sure most parents who could and know they have the choice, would want their kids to do better and try them at, other, yes. at that other school. Yes. 100%. And so, I mean, yes. Now that you're putting an extra burden on some parents, I guess, because okay, instead of dropping your kids off at one school, you got to go to you know, a couple two or three different schools. I understand that. Like, but these are logistics things that can be fixed out the education. I mean, if they're, if the kid's not getting a proper education from K through 12, it doesn't matter what you do at the university level of, letting in, you know, oh, we're going to let you in without marks. It's just going to be a lottery system. It's going to be whatever. You're having a kid going in who is not prepared and they're going to fail and they're going to drop out or they're going to fail and they're going to go into, you know, you know, they're going to go into underwater basket weaving and take out like $100,000 in debt that they're never going to pay off because their degree is going to be worthless. And it, 
I mean, like even simple things like, okay, the, the, you know, I don't know why vocational schools got such a bad rap at a point, but if a kid's learning how to be a carpenter or even a mechanic or anything like that, they have to learn math and you can teach them math while they're learning to be a carpenter. You can teach them math while, I mean, obviously the basics you have to learn in grade school, like how to add and things like that. But to learn, to be a mechanic, you have to learn, you have to know fractions. You have to know like, you know, degrees. You have to know, like, you have to know mm -hmm. these things. Same thing as being a carpenter or a plumber or, you know, a stonemason, whatever. Like, I, I don't understand why they started limit. I mean, okay, I understand because budgeting things, but this idea that well, it, sorry, yeah, ahead. it was it was budgeting. It it was also there's been this sort of like college for all mentality mm -hmm. that took over, and on the one hand, I understand where it came from, and it's a good place in the sense that it used to be that adults in school buildings would almost decide who was and was not college material. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was never, ever an acceptable way to do things where, you know, they, they would hand the really bright student. Um, they would hand her a, a pamphlet on some secretarial school. And then, you know, and it turns out that she went to Boston college or um, you, so, so there was this problem where people would look at students through their own biases and they would decide, oh, well, he's not college material, right? And so this idea of defining other people's lives was a problem. And so I have always believed every student deserves to be prepared well enough that they have options and they can decide what they want to do. And that's where I think the CTE thing is very important because it was never okay when it was used as like a place to quote unquote dump the students that that people didn't think were college material or or could succeed academically but it is a place where students can learn skills that make them employable that fill job vacancies we actually have and that um i don't know if you listen to glenn lowry um, he's a professor at Brown university and yep. he's okay. So he was just speaking the other day with this, with a guy who's done all sorts of studies and research on all sorts of stuff like this. And one of the things he talked about around CTE that I thought was interesting, especially this idea of helping students to earn certificates that are like stackable. So maybe yep. you get like a really low level one and then you learn more and you learn more is he said that you're talking about many students for whom school has been about nothing but failure. And that when you help them learn specific skills and get specific certifications, it is also their first taste of success in a quote unquote academic setting. So, and so not only are they feeling what it is to be successful, they gain confidence, they have a skill that makes them employable, that they can build on. And I don't think that we talk enough about the importance of that. Uh, so especially when four year degrees do make a huge difference for people in terms of income, we can look at the graphs and we can see that people with them do better. But the problem is we still are only looking at a population in the U.S. I believe it's like 35% of Americans go to college. If that's not the number, it's around that. I mean, okay. and, we, so and we have a ton of people that are starting and not finishing. People are taking on enormous debt. Um, and for what? And then, and then we have all of these other skills and trades and certification programs and industry certificates that they could be getting so they could lead a fulfilling, you know, employable life. And it's like some people don't even want to talk about it. Okay. Like, again, I, you know, I know the whole college thing. I, I, I graduated high school in 87 and it was around, you know, it was always like, it was pumped up through us all the way through, you know, uh, like grade school, like starting in like around grade five, grade six, and then all the way up through uh, like in Quebec high school ends at grade 11. Like all the way through, it's just like, yeah, you have to go to college. You have to go to college. You have to go to college. Um, and in Quebec, they had these things called CGEPs, which was high school went to grade 11. Then you had two years of CGEP and then three years to do your bachelor's. So it was the same amount of time, but just split up differently. 
And so the CGEPs were also set up to have uh, so two-year pre-university programs and three-year technology programs. And the technology programs could be like chemical engineering or electrical engineering. So you're not getting a bachelor's or anything, but you can go out, you can start working right away. And they yep. were really intensive. Um, you know, they, you focused everything on there. You had a lot less electives and you like, uh, and you took more courses, but you got out and you were like, you were right away or employable in a, a decent amount of money. Uh, but even that, they started pushing that away. Like I, you know, I got an arts degree. I, uh, I could have done that online. I, I, okay, I got good marks. Uh, you know, there was a couple of times I was on the Dean's list. I think my best attendance in any class was about 60%. I mean, there were classes where I went to the first class, the midterm and the final, and I still pulled off an A or an A minus. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just handed in my assignment. It was an arts class. I just like read and write and ran it in. Right. Like, I could have done that online, you know, but like actually, Okay, the certificates, that's great. Like, you know, I, I agree with that. Like, building, like, that's a way to build self esteem, not just passing someone for, you know, oh, you, right, you know, like, yes. okay, you accomplish something, but also you know, doing something with your hands. Like, I, I still think every kid should take like a wood shop or something like that. You know, just building something with your hands, doing that, that gives you some sense of accomplishment. It gives you an idea of what, you know, you might not look your nose down at a carpenter or cabinet maker or a mechanic. If you've actually spent time working with your hands, you know, you, you could probably, you know, you, you might have a PhD in philosophy, but if you can't change a flat tire at some, at some point you're useless. <laughs> it's Yes. Well, actually in many situations, you're pretty useless. <laughs> you know, but I mean, like, that's, I, I, with due respect to all the philosophy majors out there, yeah. by the way, yeah. but, and I actually, and I actually am in this, you're describing in some ways me, right? Like I think about this a lot that there's all these ba you know, basic manual tasks that can be very necessary in a, in emergency or just in whatever moment. And I'm like inept admittedly. And, and so and that's kind of your point, right? Is that as these tracks sort of diverge, it's like suddenly, I mean, we kind of had a running joke. So my husband and I both, you know, with our degrees, um, trying to figure out how to use one of these like FedEx envelopes that had this like weird, like sticky thing to the point that I'm like texting a friend I know who's, who's, who works like drives a FedEx truck. And I'm like, what the hell's up with this envelope? And he's like, it's always you people with the degrees. You can't even figure out the damn envelope. <laughs> but his point was really well taken. <laughs> yeah, but, no, but I mean, uh, the I mean, it, it, so I, I'm a hundred percent with you. I don't know. I'm a big, big fan of Mike Rowe. Yeah. And he has been beating this CTE drum and, you know, he can he can tell you how many unfilled jobs we have right now. He can talk, you know, till he's blue in the face on this topic. And he's so convincing and he has persuaded me. You know, it's like I already thought agree. And then he talks and I'm it's like even more I'm even more on board. Um, and I really wish that his voice was more prominent in the education conversation, because if it's really about which I think it should be, if it's really about children growing into young adults and then, you know, adults who have the, can who can become the best versions of themselves. They need the tools to be able to do that. Okay. Wait. And when we hand children diplomas that they hang on the wall and yet they remain ill-prepared for higher ed and unemployable, that is such a failure. Oh. And if you think about it, the school system that does that to them, as soon as they pass them out, it's, th it's not their problem anymore. You know, there's no, there's no, there's no accountability either for that system, for what it does to our communities, our economy, you know, just the, just the, even the national security piece to this, that's very related. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it's again, and that's why I always say it's really messy because it's it's so broken in so many ways and at so many levels. And the way it's, everything has become so hyper political and that's not new, like where are people that actually want to find solutions and make change? 
Yeah, I mean, like, okay, talking about tools and stuff like that, and like this. And w- w- okay, when you see it, I, like every time I see, like, okay, when you, when you start going back, and I, like I said, I just started going back and looking at things. It's like, okay, so this was an issue, and then you know, so the hyper parenting, let's just say that was an issue. So what they threw at that to fix it actually created two other problems and it's just been going out like that ex- exponentially. So whatever you're trying to fix, you're creating a couple other problems and it's going out. So now you've gotten to the point where it's so much, but okay, something like something I've been reading re- recently and I'm, I'm going to take this to a little bit of a hyperbolic uh, statement, but I kind of stand by this. Um, so that like, there's this one teacher I saw, I read it today was she's from MIT. No, sorry. Uh, she, uh, she's a high school teacher. I think she's an MIT grad or something. I don't know why they mentioned MIT in the article, but she was she said, I'm very proud that I got Homer removed from my high school. Oh, I know exactly. I know exactly who you're talking okay. about now. Okay. That, and then there was uh Lester university and it's universities on a high school, whatever, getting rid of Chaucer and wanting to get rid of their medieval English program. Uh, Oh, so you're falling down the rabbit hole of the disrupt text oh, movement. It, okay, fine. I I know where this is coming from, the, the, the decolonize or whatever, but okay, where, okay, if you want to talk about the United States, let's talk about Huck Finn, let's, you know, Tom Sawyer, talk about, um, um, sorry, not Tom Sawyer, um, uh, Jesus Christ, why can't I remember? Mark Twain, you know, Melville, like American authors, right? You can also I- include Douglas, include, you know, include Frederick Douglass, include uh, James Baldwin, include Langston Hughes, include all great American authors like Walt Whitman, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Hawthorne, all of them. You can have an American English literature course. And I mean, these are texts that have stood the test of time. Okay, not everyone's going to like Catcher in the Rye. I know some people, you know, but not everyone's going to like Slaughterhouse Five. And like these are more recent books. But like, why are why are you taking away things? Like for me, this is you're destroying their history. Like when I looked at, I was in Afghanistan and I went to where the Taliban had blown up those those Buddhas. And when I say this, I'm not trying to compare this to the the the, the children that I saw like really badly hurt or all the dead like that that is infinitely worse but one of the saddest things i saw was the destruction of the local history and the history that they took away from those people even though afghanis Mm -hmm. are not buddhists but that is their history like wiping out the classics i mean i I think it was two or three years ago cambridge said they wanted to get rid of shakespeare Mm -hmm. like you are taking away the history of a people and a culture you're damaging it and you're doing irreparable harm to the kids who I don't care if you're an immigrant that came in five years ago or last year, you've moved into the society. This is what the culture of that society is. This is what the history of that society is. You can add to it and a hundred yep. years down the road, your stuff can be included in. But right now, like, you know, I think this is doing a lot of harm to everyone. And I think this is what, like, again, going back to the vocational schools or, you know, you can have a carpentry program that teaches American literature. You know, mm-hmm. I'm sh- I, like, I have friends who, you know, they're, they're all in the trades and they've read more enlightenment stuff than some people coming out with philosophy degrees right now. You know, like there's no, like, I don't know why they separated those two. There, there shouldn't just because you're in a vocational school doesn't mean you have any interest in, you know, like I said, in, in literature or art or whatever. Or, doesn't or, like, it doesn't mean you don't like books yeah, and vice versa. You could be yep. in a, you know, purely academic field, but you like, you know, building stuff on your time off. Like, why not? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I, but this whole push to, yeah, like I said, decolonize the curriculum, the disrupt texts. But I mean, this is going back even a few years. I mean, uh, there, there's been more calls recently to, you know, g- get rid of Huck Finn and um, I'm trying to think of which other ones. Like, well, To Kill a Mockingbird yeah, yeah, has been, yeah, and, but, uh, has been you know, on the chopping block in some places for a really Lord of the flies as well. Yeah, but I mean, it's, um, it's awful. and well, part of what's really frustrating about it too, is that what we see is not only a shift because a lot of the texts that they're also trying to, and by they, you know, I'm talking about people in that, in this mm-hmm. movement, this disrupt texts movement who are, they are activists in the classroom and they have been convinced that there's either not not only not val- no value in these books, but they think that these books do harm. Yeah. 
which is weird too because when you think about how james baldwin and tony morrison talked about these texts they talked about the they talked about them with reverence yeah. um and and now we hear almost the opposite but the other thing i really that really bothers me and again i'm coming at this from a place where like i was given such a variety of books to read in high school so i don't i'm not i'm sure there are people whose curriculums were incredibly incredibly you know non-diverse when it came to came to authors and so they need to fix that right but because i'm looking at this as somebody who had to read all the authors that you just mentioned we read malcolm x we read um their eyes were watching God. We read um, Native Son. We read Black Boy, P Color Purple. I mean, we just read a lot of different authors. So to me, I'm looking at it like, why? And the other thing I was sorry, I was going to say is there's a big, there's such a lowering of expectations around quality. So for example, we're pulling really difficult texts that students usually work through because they're working through them with their teacher and their class. Um, and then we're, and then they're substituting young adult books that are written at a much lower level that I would make the argument are like, sometimes, I don't know, the themes are gratuitously dark and I don't, I don't, I just find them, Far, I find them far less worthy of the student's time than the books that people are trying to get rid of. Yeah. And by the way, can I just say one more thing about this? And I have some friends that know a lot about this topic if you ever wanted to have them on. Is people imply that these syllabi, that these syllabi are stagnant. You know, they, they imply that there's no rotation of texts happening. And the reality is a lot of teachers in schools rotate their texts in ways that like, Lord of the Flies might be on it one year and maybe it's not on it the next, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, but that's, you know, a rotation of text and a mixing it up a bit of text is not the same thing as putting these books in boxes, writing the word garbage on them, and then going on social media and bragging about how you've convinced your school system to remove these books from the curriculum. But also what, I, okay. I, what part of the problem I think, especially with these texts and stuff like that, is from the <clears throat> from the opposite side. Like, and I've used the term, and I, you know, oh, these are Western values, you know. And okay, I'm not going to discount the Western civilization. Yes, it's Western civilization or part thereof, um, because even the post-colonial stuff and communism, whatever, that came out of the West. But communism and the Enlightenment. Let's just take those two things they can go back like Marx will go back and talk about the Greeks. And so will the enlightenment thinkers, they both know where their foundation came from. Whereas these, like the, the people who are post-colonial on that, they want their foundation to be, you know, like Edward Said, like the guy who's, you know, one of the founders of post-colonial or France foot on, if you want to go back a little bit earlier and like, you know, like these people, like that's their year zero. Whereas, so I think if, if instead of saying, okay, this is, you know, Western values, like you can talk about you know, the, the foundations of Western civilization or whatever, but these are not Western values because these, this was thought that, you know, you had the Greeks and then, but if you look at some of the Greek writings, they looked down at the Egyptians and they, they liked the Egyptians, especially Plato when it came to math. Um, and then if you go past the Greeks, uh, because of Alexander and, you know, going into India, and then you have also trade between India and the Greeks, there was Stoic thought going back and forth between India and Greece going back a couple of thousand years. You know, um, again, this was something I just found out recently, so I keep pointing out, there's a guy in Ethiopia named Jacob or Jacob. He had learned a local form of rhetoric, and then he was taught by Jesuits as well. And then he fell in disfavor with the king, so he went and hid away for two years. And a hundred years before... Kant and Locke and Hume, he came up with ideas very much similar to those. These are human ideas. These are human ideals. When given a chance, we've come up with these ideas. And to show that universality and to show that, you know what, you might disagree with them and you might have a different way of doing it, mm -hmm. but at least know where it's coming from. And I don't discount that there's something being written today 
that 200 years down the road, people are going to look at that and go, yeah, you know what? This is great. This added to human knowledge, this added to human flourishing. It built off everything else. And that's going to always happen. But they have to stand the test of time. And, you know, it's good to let kids read, kids read new, new knowledge, do books and stuff. But mm-hmm. that give them that connection to what they're reading and how it's connected to where they are now. And give them that connection to their past and you know, you won't have this urge to throw it away. And I think that's what's lost with like that disruptive text or whatever, that the way they've been taught, um, the way like they've been taught to hate it because that is bad. It's, it, it's part of colonialism. I mean, some of the, like, again, I, I find this so patronizing and so insulting that, you know what, that's not for me because I'm Brown. Like, yeah, yeah, that's a um, what you just said is something I have heard from so many people who are black, either black immigrants to the U.S. or African Americans or um, people from all different places. Actually, now that I'm thinking through it in my head, it, it's like they almost are thinking, "You don't think I can handle this? You don't think I can read this? You don't think there's anything in this for me?" Like, and, and almost like they like they, what the what the the word i'm sorry the word that they'll say is that they feel almost infantilized oh, totally and it's a, that they're that and that their agency is also being taken away um andrew sullivan for people who listen he has a really good piece about this on his sub stack this week it's called the unbearable whiteness of the classics um and he's he's obviously mocking yeah. what's what's happening out there and he says um he has one sentence as he says, how do you read Aristotle and conclude that the most salient quality of his genius was that he was white? But that's, okay. And again, this is infantilizing and it's, you know, like telling me that, okay, when I hear that, like white ways of knowing this is white knowledge. I mean, University of Vermont, I think it is. They, they're starting a new white logic class. What the hell is white logic? I mean, well, it's funny that you say that because I am white, <laughs> right? And so, and suddenly I keep hearing about whiteness and I had someone just the other day, because um, what I've noticed is that when people who are not white push back on some of this stuff, they are accused of aspiring to white ideals. God, okay. you know what? And I'm like, okay, so they can't have a different opinion. They're not allowed to have the agency to have a different opinion. So, you know, they're, they're not allowed to look at it, this in the land somewhere else. Mm. But I don't know what that means. So I have lived on this planet for 47 years as a white woman. And I have no idea what that means. Okay. I mean, do you remember the term uppity? I do. Okay. And that was, you know, you're, that was being racist or sexist or whatever, right? But that's mm-hmm. what this stuff is. I mean, there's a book called Acting White. The prologue is about how Obama talked and acted white and you shouldn't. And the rest of the book is about why you shouldn't act white. Um, there was a, uh, there was a zoom conference last summer. I think it was in June in Toronto and it was about Brown complicity and white supremacy. So mm-hmm. when Brown people act white uh, and, or when Brown people are given jobs that excuses white people from saying we're not racist. See, we hired brown people, but you're taking jobs away from black people. So you're complicit in white supremacy. It's it's like I'm not getting a job for my own thing. But I, I mean, and we're exporting this stuff. Like I've seen talk of this in India, and I mean, the most I think outrageous example I saw was in South Africa. 2016, there was a conference at the University of Johannesburg that said science must fall. 2017 and 18, they had more uh, conferences in that same vein. Last year, they announced that they're going to have black physics because they have to decolonize physics and they need a black physics, not a white physics. I mean, you are, we're, we're exporting an ideology to parts of the world where they could benefit from science, reason, and objectivity. I mean, to teach kids that that is a white thing and then do it in a denigrating way that's Mm -hmm. you know a that's okay that's racist towards white people that's racist towards the the, the little kids saying you're not up to it i mean like like when i i I get so pissed off at that like i'm sorry but like you're completely insulting me like 
you know what? If you're telling me math is a white thing, you're using Arabic numerals and they're called Arabic numerals because the Arabs took them from India. The concept of zero came from India. Like, you know, algorithm is an Arab word. Algebra is mm-hmm. Arabic. Like, you know, you're, and you're calling this white. I mean, it's, it's, these people have no clue what they're talking about. And they, and their teacher, some of them are teachers. Some of them are people who instruct teachers. I mean, like, like you, like you said, like this problem is so big. It's, I, I, I mean, I've, it is so, it is so big. You're not, well, you're going to have an aneurysm over it. Yeah. Like I can see right any second. And I, I mean, imagine if a teacher, imagine if I believed what some of them are saying and I started to think, yeah, you're right. We can't expect black students to arrive on time. I mean, imagine, I mean, when you talk about, cause I'm very big on expectations. I am convinced mm-hmm. that one of the biggest problems in our schools are, is that we don't hold kids to high enough expectations. And I mean that academically, I mean that with, you know, just in, in lots of ways, I am convinced that kids are much more capable than we give them credit for. And I think that to your point about as we have also taken away the agency of children, right, to be able to walk to the park alone, to be able to do things on their own. Um, in doing that, when you take away the independence that they that they used to have back when they could just, you know, all walk from their houses and meet up somewhere and hang out for the day and it was all fine, right? So you take that away. Cause so because because so much independence and resilience and conflict resolution is learned during those times. When it's just a bunch of kids working it out. And then you add to that the theft of agency happening and the and the lowering of expectations happening when they get older and in school. It's almost like this crippling thing. Oh, I no, we can't expect I can't expect you to to use proper grammar in this paper. And I can't expect um, you to arrive on time now, but I can expect the white students. I mean, that is like, it's as I feel sometimes like I'm watching like a special, a movie from a different time period. Yeah, it's, I mean, and that's how I feel about these, um, you know, these, these schools that are starting to sort people into these different groups for these meetings. And it doesn't matter if you say, well, they're optional. The reality is if you're on staff and you want to be hired back or you want a promotion, you know, are you really going to speak out against these groups that are forcing you, you know, you have to go in this room because you're white and this person has to go into that room because they're black. And then this person has to go over here because they're Jewish. I mean, it is literally a vile concept in my opinion. And I have friends that I respect and admire who really believe in the value of affinity groups. And, you know, maybe someday we'll have a long conversation about that. But um, I don't land there. Okay. You know, this stuff. Okay. Again, like I said, I've been looking at this. So around 2010 in, you know, so the coastal cities, so like New York, LA, uh, I think Seattle, maybe Portland, you know, I think maybe Boston, but around 2010 is when this stuff started coming, like, like critical race theory based curriculum started coming into high schools. And then 2013, you had it going crazy in campuses or 2013, 2014. And it's like, okay, it starts in 2010. They graduate high school with a base of this. They get to college and it's, oh, it's full force in universities. But I'm, at the same point, I'm looking at it. Okay. You, you've got, so you're f- having education that's focusing on race. That's getting kids to focus on racial identity. You're putting one, you're, you're putting the white kids down. You're telling everyone else they've been oppressed by the white kids. And you're scratching your head going, why is, why are racial tensions hot rising? And why is white supremacy going up? I mean, like, you know, like, honestly, Dare, you've got your head, like, on, you've literally got your head in your sand. I, I remember back to the late eighties when you had like, or mid to late eighties, where you had like the, you know, increase in gang violence. And then, you know, they had like a lot of skinhead stuff rising up too, because it's basically, you know, they were fighting over drug, drug territory and whatever, but like all these gangs rose up. And how did the police and the FBI, whenever they talked about it, it's like, okay, you know what? They recruit by looking for kids who are marginalized. They recruit by looking for the loners. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're teaching this to kids, I mean, it's a smorgasbord for, you know, any kind of extremist group to go pick those kids up. Like, why do you think the Boogaloo boys are getting more people joining up? Why do you think 
you know, Antifa? Why do you think the Proud Boys? Why do you think any of these groups are getting more people to join up? It's like you're creating a smorgasbord for, for extremism. And uh, uh, there's one book I read. It's, it, it's out of Pennsylvania. I don't know how many schools are teaching it. It's called Not My Idea. And it's kindergarten kids, mind you. Mm-hmm. And it, again, focuses on race. And in it, there's a contract. There's a page that talks about your contract with whiteness. And it's, you're signing away your soul. And it says whiteness, you know, uh, whiteness has had, it's, you've got stolen land. You get special privileges. Uh, you get, you get to be an oppressor. I mean, it, you're teaching this to kindergarten kids. Oh yeah. I just saw the, the, uh, the resources on the Los Angeles Unified yeah. School District website. And it includes um, these woke kindergarten read alouds. I know. And the first one I watched was all about um, gender identity and uh, pronouns. And at one point the reader says, and you must do this because this is how we do it in woke kindergarten. So it's like literally like, I don't know a lot of kindergartners who don't want to do what their teacher tells them. You know what I mean? So it's almost like compelled speech for a kindergartner on a topic that is so completely out of the realm yeah. of what they should have on their minds. Exactly. I mean, okay. Again, I'm and, and I don't say that. And by the way, like, I don't say that, like, I am well aware of schools where there has been a transgender student in the early grades. And then a conversation happens, right? Because now they need some information to help them understand and navigate something happening with their classmate and their schoolmate. That is not the same as, as, you know, forcing children at very young ages everywhere to learn about these topics that I think um, in many cases the schools have, are, have completely crossed the line. I would make the argument that they are very, very anti-science on some of this stuff. So it's like, it's like we don't teach biology here. We teach the opposite of biology. We teach anti-biology. Um, and it creates a confusion. Like, I'm always like, guys, I've got a little boy bouncing on a trampoline outside who believes in Santa Claus. Like, what are you, you're not talking to him about this. Exactly. And I mean, okay. And I, and so, yeah, so I, not to mention, I was just reading this thing. I'm remembering this, this thing. Megan Kelly mentioned it because she talked about, um, the final straw where she pulled her kids out of school in the school in New York city where they were attending. And it was because of this thing that went around, um, the faculty, um, which I think was, and her point was kind of like, it went around to this diversity group that I think included faculty and parents. And it said, there is a killer cop sitting in every single, in every school where white children learn. They gleefully soak in their whitewashed history that downplays the Holocaust of indigenous native peoples and Africans in the Americas. They happily believe their all white spaces exist as a matter of personal effort and willingly use violence against black bodies to keep those spaces white. Yeah. I mean, okay. That's how they were speaking about the children in the school. Yeah, yeah, okay. That, that, like, okay. That's, you know, I'm going to equate this to Islam again. And cause I, I see a lot of parallels between, I know a lot of people talk about the religious aspect of it. So what, well, it does okay, sound dogmatic. Okay, that's for okay, sure. When you have like when you had the madrasas, right? So the madrasas are they're beyond like they're they're ultra orthodox faith schools. So it's not just like a Catholic school taught by Jesuits where you learn the Catholicism, right? This is like it's nothing. It's Genesis. You're learning like that's the science. It's the science of Genesis, right? You're not learning anything else. Now, these started flourishing in Pakistan in the late like starting around seventy nine between seventy nine eighty one. They started really growing. You have some of them in, you have, well, quite a few in the UK. Uh, you have some in other parts of Europe. You have less in Canada and the United States uh, just because of our distance and it's harder to get here. Now, not every kid that goes to a madrasa, and I mean, these are all over South South Asia. They're in the Middle East. Like not every kid is going to join ISIS or Al-Qaeda. Some of them are going to join the Muslim Brotherhood. Some of them are going to join groups like CARE. They're going to be conservative Muslims. Others are going to be where they will not condemn the Charlie Hebdo killings. You know, mm-hmm. I, I like, I don't like the stats. When I say I don't like the stats of the States, I don't like the way they were done. 
I'd like, to, but I'd like to, you know, but again, I'd like to see them better, but I, a stat I'll take from the UK. And again, because I think there's more fundamentalist Muslims in the UK than there are in the States, but it was uh, 98% of UK Muslims thought homosexuality should be uh, you know, a criminal offense. And this is, this statistic is three or four years old now, so it could have changed. What you're doing with these schools, you're creating woke madrasas. Now, mm-hmm. not every kid is going to go join Antifa or the Proud Boys. Not every kid is going to be, you know, woke to the extreme, but some of them will be in that political layer where the Muslim Brotherhood is. So like either an AOC or take anyone you want on the Republican side, you know, someone who is pushing like a, you know, an evangelical Christian thing or, you know, ultra nationalist or whatever, right? Like why, Mm -hmm. what's her name? Uh, The, the green, like what's the new Republican there? Okay. Okay. The Marjorie Taylor green. Okay. I, I think AOC is smarter than her. And, you know, I'm not saying like, but I think there's some level of craziness in AOC as well, but like this, and then the rest, you'll have people who will are okay with the canceling. And they're, they're like, Oh, well, you know, yeah, we really need to have the FBI crack down insurgents. And so let's, you know, or they'll go along with, okay, never hire anyone who worked for the Trump administration, things like that. Like, mm-hmm. You, you're creating a completely and utterly divisive school system. And you're also like, you're talking about like, they're not teaching biology anymore. When this is going on in biology departments, you know, like biology departments in the universe, in universities are discussing whether or not sex and gender are real, you know, or it's a construct. How the hell are biology departments going to defend themselves against create, uh, you know, intelligent design. If that creeps up Mm -hmm. again, like we're losing all our sense making. And mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of my big reasons I'm focusing on education. I don't have kids. I've got a niece and a nephew, but I don't have kids. I mean, like I'm looking at this because when I'm an old fart, I want my doctors to be able to know how to be doctors. I want, <laughs> yo, I, I, I can't. yeah, <laughs> no, I, uh, we hear this actually a lot. I hear this a lot from people as they say, who the hell is going to take care of me when I'm older? You know, when, when all these, when everybody's, you know, they're not learning what they need to know, but they're learning all this other stuff. And now they're focusing on, yeah, no, it's, um, and it's funny too, because I noticed, you know, I keep seeing this thing about how your, you, you know, now you get to decide your gender, that, that you're born and that your, your, that your anatomy is like, doesn't really tell us anything. <laughs> and you get to decide later, blah, blah. Or I see, you know, all of these different choices of, of pronouns. And again, like, yeah, there's under 1% of Americans like are transgender or have gone through some sort of gender dysphoria. I'm not pretending that's not true, but it's at the moment, it's like, you know, it's, we're acting like this is, this is, you know, I don't know. Like, I feel like, 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 you know how I focus a lot on boys and males. I mean, my God, I feel like, you know, transgenderism gets far more attention than, than half the people in our population do. Um, but the, my father has had two kidney transplants and the second time around, I was kind of hoping that maybe I'd be able to be the donor. Turned out that my mom remarkably was a perfect match. But as I went through that process, it matters. You are male or you are female when you are being tested, right? To possibly give an organ to someone and, and any sort of medical thing I've had to look at and deal with, I'm realizing that when push comes to shove, it matters. Oh, like nobody's playing around. No, but okay. In Canada now we're having a law going through. It's probably going to pass. I think the votes in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and they had something similar just passed in the province I live in, but so Bill C6, they label it as anti-conversion therapy. So most people are thinking, you know, electrodes to gay and lesbian kids and, and, mm-hmm. and you know, no one wants that, but they put in gender identity. So everything has to be gender affirming. And they, there was a, I can't remember if he was a member of the federal government or a, a provincial, one of the provincial uh, members of one of the provincial parliaments, but he said, Oh, Oh, detransitioners, that's just a right-wing myth. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, and I'm like, this was right after the Kira Bell story had broke. And he's still saying, oh, that's just a right-wing myth. And I'm like, so now they've got, like, you've already had this happen once. And uh, 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 this is the most egregious one. So this one made the news. I don't know how many other minor ones happened, but there was a kid who was 
just changed schools. I think the kid was about six years old and he walked into the wrong washroom in a new school, just gone to a brand new school. Plus the kid's autistic and walked out. Some school officials saw him walking out of the girl's washroom and said something along the lines of, Oh, have you told your parents you're a girl? And the kid being autistic, didn't know what the teacher was talking about. Just got lost, went in the wrong washroom and just said, no, they would be mad at me. There's already a law in Ontario that if the parents aren't affirming the gender of the child, and if a school official thinks so, Child Protective Services can take the child. This autistic kid. Are you serious? Yeah, this autistic kid spent three days oh with my God. CPS until their parents could get them back. Uh I spoke to a civil rights lawyer in, in Canada and she's representing these parents who are suing a school because in kindergarten, their daughter was asked to put on a spectrum. Like they had, you know, on one side, male, one side, female. Oh, put where yep, you are. I've seen this. Yeah. Yep. And she put it all the way on the female end. And the teacher said, no, there's no such thing. You're no, you're not a girl like that. No one is. And it's like, She's and you're like, why are you? This is not a topic you should be discussing with yeah. my daughter. And I mean, it, it like so again, well, I'm like, I started working on some videos for this, like, try to help parents out. Um, to at least that they could have, like, you know, here's the science. But when I started going through the curriculum, like, I'm still reading through it, it's in every single province, and it's this thing called Soji. So it's, I think, like, uh, uh, I can't remember. I can't remember what it sounds for. It's like gender identity, like sex, something gender identity or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But it's some of it's fine. It's like, yo, know, some people have two dads. Some people have two moms. It's okay. That's a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's normal. But then they start telling kids that they can be whatever they want. And I mean, it's like, you know, I thought I was Spider-Man when I was <laughs> like, you know, like, I tried to climb a wall. Like, I mean, if you're like, are you really going to take me seriously? Like, uh, it's, 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 well, that's exactly, I mean, and the other thing is the rapid onset <sighs> dysphoria and adolescence. I mean, that's just a totally different category of situation than the child who sort of like from the yeah. very, very beginning of their life. But yeah, just feels like they're in the wrong body. I mean, those are two very different. And also like all of the evidence shows that when pe people have gender dysphoria when they're younger, that two thirds of them grow up to be gay, yep. that they're not transgender, that they grow up to be homosexual. But when you begin, you know, not just affirming, but pretending, I mean, this is what I find to be the most um, grotesque in ways part of this is that there's often a lot going on with the, with the person in terms of their mental health and their emotional health and somebody holds out this carrot. Oh, well, if you just do this, this will solve all your problems, right? And good luck finding somebody who had their breasts removed and who transitioned, who suddenly tells you all of those problems, you know, suddenly went away. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, my God, I have to sign papers for my children to be allowed to take Tylenol in school. And yet, in some places, not where I live, the idea that my child would be able to exist as, a, as the opposite gender without me knowing and or, you know, essentially mutilate their body without me knowing. I mean, this is a level of insanity that is... is uh, kind of crazy and it feels as if their people have been so bullied into not wanting to wade into this because of the fierce backlash that it causes it's, it, it, i don't know if you read the book kindly Inquisitor, inquisitors like i keep mentioning it it's and jonathan roach talks about it he called it he called this the humanitarian threat so it's a humanitarian type of author, authoritarianism it's okay you know don't you want to be anti-racist you know don't you want to stop transphobia don't you want to stop homophobia like they they, they pull at your emotions they pull it like it's rhetorical and, manipulation and, complete rhetorical manipulation and it and it twists people all up because it's like landmines everywhere mm -hmm. and so they just stay out of it i mean that's what i'm noticing i'm actually kind of blown away by the as i watch all of these young female athletes you know 
suddenly lose their titles and their the records that they've set and their scholarships and all of these things, right? I mean, as you see the erasure of women in some ways in some of these sports because of biological males being allowed to compete against them, I'm like, where are the marches and the pink hats now? Oh, okay. You know, the, the sports thing, I mean, that, that's, that's absolutely horrible. There was one, because it, it just really struck out to me. So this person was running for, uh, it was, I think it was at the state level Democratic Party in New York. Now, it was male to female uh, transition, but they, like, whatever, she hadn't done anything. Like no hormones, as far as I could tell, and there was a picture of a speech, like she was giving. I don't know if it's she, they, whatever. Um, and it's like one of those like tight fitting skirts. It's almost like a sweater type of thing. Like you know, like it's a, it's got a heart on. It's got an erection. You can see it. And this was at the Democratic Party was saying it was because we don't have enough women representation, so now we do. And at the same point, this guy was running, or this girl, whatever, I don't know. I mean, maybe I just, you know, committed some grave sin here. It was running for office, and at the same time was saying, all you turfs can suck my lady dick. And this was from the Re Democratic Party. And they were still up and running. And it's, it's, it's literally, it's funny, too, because I'm, like, so <laughs> on this issue, standing up for boys and males, right? So yeah. that bothers people. And then on the other side, I'm out here yelling from the rooftops on behalf of girls and them needing to be able to have female only spaces and also be able to compete on a level playing field. Yeah. And that means that males can't be on it. Yeah. Right. And so and, and, and in both cases, I'm, I'm asking myself, where are the people standing up? I mean, for what's right, number one. But uh, I mean, this idea that that uh, I saw girls crying, actually, a high school swim team because a the school board voted to allow this transgender fem female. So, but again, no, you know, mm -hmm. no surgery, nothing, just a male who identifies as female to freely use the locker room with all the girls. Who are who are changing into bathing suits? I mean, they are getting naked and changing into bathing suits, and they're being told that they have to change in front of this person. And if they don't want to, that makes them a bigot. Like I, I don't know if it was the same school, but I read about one school where the boys at their school said, "You know what? Any girl that wants, knock on our change room door. We'll all leave. We'll make sure no one else goes in, and you can go use our changing room." Because they didn't want that. Because they know yeah. how wrong it yeah. is. Okay, but like when you're mentioning the boys thing, because I want to speak to you. I, I don't want to keep you too, too much longer. Like, you know, I, I could talk about, I, I could talk with you about this for hours because this is like, you know, really bugs me. But I'd like to talk about the boy thing. But there was one thing there. That, there was some school, I can't remember what it was. Uh, so a little boy teased a little girl, just like little boys do. Like, I think they were like, you know, around seven years old or something like that, if I remember the story correctly. First, second grade, so we're in there. And the little girl, I don't know if she tattled or something, but the boy got a suspension. And the and this was their little girl talking about it, something along the lines of, well, he didn't need to be suspended. I just wish they told him not to do it. Right. And then so she saw, thought that was unfair. So she then went to, she's telling this, and like it was in a news story. She told her and all her friends decided that they weren't going to tattle on any more boys because they saw the unfairness of what happened to that one kid. But I'm like, okay, at the same point, you're now showing these little girls that you don't tattle, you know, oh, like, I'm not saying in that case, the boy was wrong and he needed a suspension, but in some cases he might be, but if you have that idea, well, we don't want to tattle on them because it's going to be, a, you know, a disproportionate response. It might then, then, then when you need to protect yourself, you might not. Yeah, exactly. You've got like that in you to bring in an adult. Yeah. You might not because if yeah, no, it's, um, it's uh yeah there's there's a lot of things that don't make any sense and um 
And the only, what I will say is as much as, you know, for a long time, people kept saying, oh, please, it's just in the colleges. This is like, you know, you're crying wolf. It's not that bad. It's no big deal. Right. Like the, it was like the people that were sort of raising the red flag on all this stuff. Um, and I guess by this stuff, I would talk about some of this critical race theory, gender theory, um, queer theory, not just that it exists, but that it's absolutely seeped into our school systems, our classrooms, our curriculum, yeah. academia, the corporate world, the nonprofit yeah. world. But, but, but for me, if I have to, you know, for me, the biggest alarm bells for me are related to the, it being in schools, yeah. particularly publicly funded schools that parents are assigned to based on their address. Oh. Um, you know, like, like as much as I think what these private schools are doing is nuts if people want to pay a lot of money for that for their children, and if that school's not, if the school's not getting any public money, so yeah, be it, I guess. Exactly. Like you want to send your kid to a faith school, I don't care as long as that's coming out of your pocket, you know. But and people want to send their kids to like the Dalton Academy or the Fieldstone Academy in New York City, and they're paying like big bucks for it. Where the Fieldstone Academy, if they'll get your kids for forty-five minutes a week to separate by race and talk about how horrible white people are. I mean, go, go, go right ahead, fill your boots. But you know. Yeah, public funded money for this stuff is horrible. Um, like I said, I if you don't, if you got a little bit of time, I would like to talk about like what's happening with like boys in school because yeah, I have a little bit more. I, c- I can probably do about ten more minutes. Yeah, sure. If you wouldn't mind going into that a little bit, because like I've been reading some of your stuff on that, and you see more and more statistics coming out. It's kind of scary. Yeah, and the thing is, so it's not new. I mean, one of the things it's just that if you look at any almost any metric, really what we see is that boys are way behind in all the good stuff and they're way ahead in all the bad stuff. Um, and that's not, not just boys. That also includes males and men in general, but, but certainly it is the case for, for boys. And it would be one thing if this was new information, right? Like suddenly we were seeing this, you know, suddenly we're seeing a decline, but this has been going on for decades. Books were written about it, you know, in 2000, more books were written about it in 2008, so we'd known um, there was an article in the Atlantic in 2010 called The End of Men. And so, um, and it's a hyperbolic title, obviously, but the stats in that article were incredibly alarming and that we're now in 2021 and things have only gotten worse. Um, but essentially, I think what we're seeing is, is, is a few different things. We, we have um, a school system that has increasingly made kindergarten much more academic so boys develop more slowly than girls in terms of their verbal skills. And so usually they'll be behind in the beginning. And then the idea was that they would kind of catch up by like fifth or sixth grade. And kindergarten used to be very play-based. There was a lot of movement. There was a lot of outside time. There was a lot of hands-on building things, touching things. But as it's become much more academic and there's so the expectation has been been very much more about sitting quietly, listening to your teacher, you know, learning to read, read this. And so um, boys are just really having a tough time with that. So you already see in the pre-K and, you know, starting with pre-K, you see boys being suspended and expelled. I think it's five at five times the rate of girls and those you know, the, I, I just got, they're expelling kids at a pre-K. Like, what do you, oh, do? Yeah. what do you do? Not fingerprint correct correctly. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of hard to say. Like, I think it sometimes is hyperactivity. Maybe sometimes it's like, again, like I don't, a child may hit right in a way that's obviously not appropriate, but also not um, a sign that they're like, that, the, that it's aggression that's going to hurt somebody, right? I mean, I raised three sons. I obviously know this. Um, and so, or, or am raising three sons. So, and the tolerance, I mean, d- don't forget, like we've gone to a lot of zero tolerance in a lot of ways. So something that a teacher could have like helped kids work out back in the day, like now it can be like a, you know, you're out of here type of thing. So, so um, boy behavior, the innate, of boys right so that sort of movement rambunctious risk-taking adventure competition i mean there's these are all and again these are generalizations there are obviously exceptions to these rules but a lot of that's been taken out of school 
Like, like my, you're not allowed to play tag at recess at a lot of schools. You're not allowed to play any games that are that like, like, you know how when kids are, are little, they'll do a lot of like good guys versus bad guys mm-hmm. and they'll have guns or swords. None of that. They, they don't want anything that's even like anything that's even emblematic of a weapon. Schools like freak out. So even when a kid's like wants to be the good guy, right? Like he wants to, because so often the reason, that they love superheroes so much is that they love the adventure and they love the, the 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 being the good guy right they go out and they save and they rescue but lots of times that still involves some kind of weaponry yeah. and so that's kind of off limits then you have the kids who like they love competition right when I mean, we know this i mean even in my house my god they compete over everything one throws his sock and gets it in the basket the other one has to throw his sock and get in the basket next thing you know you know, who makes cookies better? Who loads the dishwasher better? So <laughs> who got a bigger piece of cake? Com- <laughs> competition has been like, com- competition has been like very also kind of removed from schools, you know, even these. So, so the point is I'm, I'm going on and on, but the reality is it's just not a very, very, it's not an environment that sets boys up for success speaking in general terms. So academically, We've, they've been behind in reading for a long, long time, kind of forever. But, you know, the reading gap is very big. The writing gap is bigger. Um, and it used to be, oh, okay, well, at least they're still better in math, right? They used to say in joke, well, that has also, in many places, the girls have also surpassed them in math. So, um, but then you add, so you, so you take the academics and it's sort of the lack of success in academics and them feeling like, the books aren't interesting to them. They want to write about something and the teacher doesn't think it's a good topic, but often it's a fine topic. It's just not a topic she likes because she's not a little boy, you know? So a little boy might be like, I love wrestling. I want to write about wrestling. No, no, that's not really a very good topic. But then, you know, if the, if, if the girl in the class wants to write about, I don't know, like, I don't even know, like a, like a, her a birthday party or riding a bike, you know, that's fine. So it's like, again, it's this weird, like wrestling is not inherently a bad, isn't a bad topic. So there's a lot of issues around just kind of like boys being penalized for their, their innate sort of nature. Yeah. I mean, okay. Again, I think some of this comes back to the gender stuff and I mean, you know, it's like the genders, like I saw this one, there was a little parent, it was a parent telling a little, little girl, well, do you like boy things or do you like girl things? Do you like jumping? Oh, I saw and that. I like, okay. But what happened to no gender stereotypes? So now it's like, okay, well, we got to curtail, like, you know, this is a male aggression or toxic masculinity. So we have to curtail, you know, rambunctiousness. Or you know, playing tag. Like I, I don't understand what what's wrong with tag. Or I mean, like some of the, or any kind of competition. Like kids need that, but it's it's. I think there's like so much of this stuff. Like before, it was okay. We had this gender stuff, you know, gender theory, or whatever, and that was kind of enclosed. And then you had the race theory, and you had all this other stuff. But now it's they're all mixing with each other, and it's mm-hmm. you know. Uh, race mixing with gender and so like it was in the past summer it was not just black lives matter but black trans lives matter and then you know Mm -hmm. this and that and it's just again like i little kids don't have and i'm not this is not to say little kids aren't smart little kids can you know you know like you know like you know pearls of wisdom or whatever like you know out of the mouths Mm -hmm. of babes and all that right but they don't have the the capacity to understand like how complicated these things are and nor and nor should they yeah, and they shouldn't I mean, yeah i mean little kids should be little kids i mean and keep in mind this is at a time when most children especially boys can't read on grade level this isn't like uh-huh. okay everybody's already everybody knows all their subjects down pat so now we're going to add this extra <laughs> this extra unit i mean we're talking about very very basic we're talking about not send children not having basic basic skills and 
Um, and I know you had Ian Rowe on and he um, who founded public prep. And I mean, he's a big advocate for single sex schools. And one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of the African-American men who run single sex schools do it precisely because they know or they knew that um, black boys in particular were being so poorly served by school because their needs were the needs of boys were different and not being met in the school system. Yeah, I mean, and part of that was because what those boys need had been sort of taken out of the system. Yeah, I, I remember in our school. Uh, well, okay, I, I went to a bunch of different schools when I from like kindergarten to grade six, but one of them they actually did that for some classes. They they separated certain classes where. Um, it was boys and girls being taught separately or they divide the class down the middle. And on one side, they were teaching to boys on the other side, they were teaching to girls, but they were using different techniques and stuff like that. So I can see that, but you know, then there's also the argument, like, cause I see it coming from like an Islamic block background where it's completely gender segregated, you know, even as far as up through mm -hmm. university and stuff, and they don't learn how to deal with the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. So you'll have, grown men acting like awkward teenagers because they don't know how to deal with a woman. So, I mean, you know, there is the, that problem as well. Like, you know, maybe for the first three years or something, I don't know, like until you get the basics down, like, I don't know how, like, I'm not a teacher and like that. I have to work. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's like, I could see why some of that would work, but again, do what works for the kids and give the parents the options. Exactly right. My children are all in co-ed schools. I don't see any need for my children to be in single sex schools, but I certainly know plenty of people who feel like the, you know, the all boys school that their son attends, they feel like it has changed the trajectory of his life, but their circumstances are very different than mine. Um, and what their, what their son wasn't getting was very different as well so um but the statistics on boys and men are grim yeah and i mean it's and if the statistics on half year's population are grim then you know I, I, and I'm afraid. i mean imagine this right like i i looked the other day at my own date that the data in my own state and 80 percent of the suicides in my state for under people under age 25 are males imagine if that was flipped how often we'd hear about it yeah. I've never heard a single person. I've never heard a single official in my state mention it. Not one. Now I heard a lot. I hear a lot about girls and women, girls and women, women of color, girls and women, girls and women. But she meant my governor mentioned the um, increase in opioid deaths because of COVID 74% of those are males. She didn't mention that. So we're talking like, it's one thing I'm like, if you want to focus on disparities, I'm fine with that. But can we talk about all of them? Mm hmm. You know, I don't want to pick and choose the disparities because they align with one with a popular narrative. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about disparities because if we don't. Like, for example, seven times as many males have dropped out of college during covid than females, seven times as many. And you want it to, and the headlines keep saying. That it's black and Latinos who are dropping out of college because they want to again, they want to get this. It's yeah. this race conversation but it's black and Latino males yeah. and they don't want to include that part because that's not the game they're playing. Nope. And it's, but, I mean, I, I like some of that stuff too. Like I look at, I think it was Washington state. They included Asians as white. It was white and Asians. Yep. And oh yeah. That, 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 that's a new move as well. That they're complete. And, and by the way, we're talking about, I mean, these are families that were, that came with n many of them with nothing to this country. Yeah who have worked. I mean, and you know what? There's a lot of white people that have all, that also came to this country with nothing. But the, but the point is they're talking about Asians as if they came in with some huge advantage and that's why they're doing better. And I'm thinking, or it could be like, I mean, look at the work ethic of a lot of these families who's, for whom education is the priority. Well, I mean, okay, like I, I think it was in Washington State. If you took the took the Asians out of the statistic, you know, whites were only 16% of the certain of the schools. You know, like, like the, the like, correct. Uh, uh, yep. So it's like, okay, 
you need to bump that up. Like then if you looked at like black and Latino, they were like, you know, 13 and 10%. So there was not that huge differential. Differential was the Asian kids. Correct. Especially in the, especially in these exam schools where, you know, these schools that are, you take an exam to get in and um, they're, t they tend to be considered like elite high schools. The, the, the level of academic rigor is very high those schools are often predominantly Asian. And that is why you see the Asian community speaking out so much about these shifts to, um, you know, to wanting to get rid of the exam and do like an open lottery Yeah, because that will hurt. I mean, it, it will, it will hurt them the most. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? It's going to hurt poor kids the most poor kids of all colors. It's not just going to hurt. Mm -hmm. it's, it's... Anyways, well, that's kind of right. Because the other thing that people forget is that, for a lot of children, their ticket, yeah. their ticket, it r rests on a lot of these things that are being eliminated. Yeah. And just huge, huge disservice. Look, I, like I said, I don't want to keep you too long. Thank you very much. This was awesome. Oh, you're I, welcome. I'd love to have you back on sometime to go further into this, but if you want to let people know where they can get a hold of you and you know, like where they can find your stuff and I'll put all the links in. And... I'd be happy to. Um, so on Twitter, I'm at, E Sanzi, S A N Z I. Um, my Substack is what is the address? I should know this actually. Oh, it's, like Sans, it's like it's like substack.sanzi.com or sanzi.substack.com. Okay, so sanzi.substack.com. Please subscribe because I love getting messages that somebody subscribed. It means that somebody wants to, it's like a win for both of us. You get an email and I get to find out somebody wants to read my work. At the moment, all the content is free. Um, I generally like to write mostly about education and also um, sometimes things about motherhood as they relate to education, sometimes just in general. Um, and I also am the editor at Project Forever Free, which is a um, platform, again, that just features a lot of really smart people writing about the issue of education. Well, thank you very much again. And thanks everyone for listening.